Welcome to the Wolf and the Crows, free lads sitting around talking about thrones. Well, I'm Gullis. Welcome back, guys. Wolf and the Crows, audiobook of Fire and Blood. Well over halfway through this bad boy now. Thanks for joining in each week, listening to me sit and read this. Hope you're going to stay tuned for the rest. Find out what is going to happen in this dying of the dragons. And obviously, all this is going to be shown as part of House of the Dragon. Whenever HBO bring that out, hopefully next year sometime. Make sure you like, share, subscribe, Patreon, hit the join button, share it everywhere. All the usual guys, you know it by now. Chapter 14, The Dying of the Dragons. A son for a son. Aegon had been proclaimed king in the dragon pit. Rhaenyra, queen of Dragonstone. All efforts at reconciliation having failed, the dance of the dragons now began in earnest. On Driftmark, the sea snake ship set sail from Holland Spice Town to close the gullet, choking off trade to and from King's Landing. Soon after, Jacaris Valerion was flying north upon his dragon, Vermax, his brother Lucarus south on Arax, whilst Prince Daemon flew Caraxes to the Trident. Let us turn first to Harrenhal. Though large parts of Harrenhal's great folly were in ruins, the castle's towering curtain walls still made it as a formidable a stronghold as any in the Riverlands. But Aegon the Dragon had proved it vulnerable from the sky. With its lord, Laris Strong, away in King's Landing, the castle was but lightly garrisoned. Having no wish to suffer the fate of Black Harren, its elderly castellan, Sir Simon Strong, uncle to the late Lord Lionel, great uncle to Lord Laris, was quick to strike his banners when Caraxes lighted atop King Spire Tower. In addition to the castle, Prince Damon at a stroke had captured the not inconsiderable wealth of House Strong and a dozen valuable hostages, amongst them Sir Simon and his grandsons. The castle's small folk became his captives as well, amongst them a wet nurse named Eilis Rivers. Who was this woman? A Serbian wench who dabbled in potions and spells, says Munkin. A woods witch, claims Septon Eustace. A malign enchantress who bathed in the blood of virgins to preserve her youth, much room would have us believe. Her name suggests bastard birth, but we know little of her father and less of her mother. Munkin and Eustace tells us that she was sired by Lord Lionel Strong in his callow youth, making her a natural half-sister to his sons Harwin, Breakbones, and Laris, the clubfoot. But Mushroom insists that she was much older, that she was wet nurse to both boys, perhaps even to their father a generation earlier. Though her own children had all been stillborn, the milk that flowered so abundantly from the breasts of Eilis Rivers had nourished countless babes born of other women at Harrenhal. Was she in truth a witch who lay with demons, bringing forth dead children as payment for the knowledge they gave her? Was she a simple-minded slattern, as Eustace believes, a wanton who used her poisons and potions to bind men to her body and soul? Eilis Rivers was at least 40 years of age during the Dance of the Dragons. That much is known. Mushroom makes her even older. All agreed she looked younger than her years, but whether this was simply happenstance or achieved through her practice of dark arts, men continue to dispute. Whatever her powers, it would seem Daemon Targaryen was immune to them, for little is heard of this supposed sorceress whilst the prince held Harrenhal. The sudden bloodless fall of Black Harren's seat was counted a great victory for Queen Rhaenyra and her blacks. It served as a sharp reminder of martial prowess of Prince Daemon and the power of Caraxes, the blood wine, and gave the Queen a stronghold in the heart of Westeros to which her supporters could rally. And Rhaenyra had many such in the lands watered by the Trident. When Prince Daemon sent forth his call to arms, they rose up all along the rivers, knights and men at arms, humble peasants who had yet remembered the realm's delight, so beloved of her father, and the way she smiled and charmed them as she made her progress through the Riverlands in her youth. Hundreds and then thousands buckled on their sword belts and donned their mail, or grabbed a pitchfork or a hoe and a crude wooden shield, and began to make their way to Harrenhal to fight for Viserys's little girl. 
The lords of the trident, having more to lose, were not so quick to move. But soon enough, they too began to throw their lots in with the queen. From the twins rode Sir Forrest Frey, the very same full Frey, who had once begged for Rhianra's hand, now growing into a most pursuant knight. Lord Samuel Blackwood, who had once lost a jewel for her favour, raised her banners of raven tree. Sir Amos Bracken, who had won that jewel, followed his lord father when House Bracken declared for Aegon. The mountains of Maidenpool, the pipers of Pink Maiden Castle, the roots of Haraway, the Darries of Darry, the Malisters of Seaguard, and the Vances of Wayfarer's Rest all announced their support for Rhianra. The Vances of Atranta took the other path and trumpeted their allegiance to the young king. Peter Piper, the grizzled lord of Pink Maiden, spoke for many when he said, I swore her my sword. I'm older now, but not so old that I have forgotten the words I said. And it happens I still have the sword. The Lord Paramount of the Trident, Grover Tully, had been an old man even at the Great Council of 101, where he spoke for Prince Viserys. Though now failing, he was no less stubborn. He had favoured the rights of the male claimant than 101, and the years had not changed his views. Lord Grover insisted that River Run would fight for the young King Aegon, yet no such word went forth. The old lord was bedridden and would not live much longer, River Run's meister had declared. I would sooner the rest of us did not die with him, declared Sir Elmo Tully, his grandson. River Run has no defence against Dragonfire, he pointed out to his own sons, and both sides in this fight rode dragons. And so whilst Lord Grover thundered and fulminated from his deathbed, Riveron barred its gates, manned its walls and held its silence. Meanwhile, a very different story was playing out to the east, for Jakaris Valeron descended upon the Eyrie on his young dragon Vermax to win the Vale of Arran for his mother. The maiden of the Vale, Lady Jane Arran, was five and thirty, twenty years his senior. Never wed, Lady Jane had reigned over the Vale since the death of her father and elder brothers at the hands of the stone crows of the hills when she was three. Mushroom tells us that this famous maiden was in truth a high-born harlot with a ferocious appetite for men and gives us a celestial tale of how she offered Prince Jacaris the allegiance of the Vale only if he could bring her to climax with his tongue. Septon Eustace repeats the widespread rumour that Jen Aaron preferred the intimate companionship of other women, then goes on to say it was not true. In this instance, we must be grateful for Grandmeister Munkin's true telling, for he alone confines himself to the high hall of the Eyrie rather than its bedchambers. Thrice have my own kin sought to replace me, Lady Jen told Prince Jacaris. My cousin, Sir Arnold, is wont to say that women are too soft to rule. I have him in one of my sky cells, if you would like to ask him. Your Prince Daemon used his first wife most cruelly, it is true, but notwithstanding your mother's poor taste and consorts, she remains our rightful queen, and mine own blood besides, and Aaron on her mother's side. In this world of men, we women must band together. The veil and its night shall stand with her, if her grace will grant me one request. When the prince asked what that might be, she answered, Dragons. I have no fear of armies. Many and more have broken themselves against my bloody gate, and the area is known to be impregnable. But you have descended on us from the sky, as Queen Visenya once did during the conquest, and I was powerless to halt you. I must like feeling powerless. Send me dragon riders. And so the prince agreed, and Lady Jane knelt before him and bade her warriors to kneel, and all swore them their swords. Then on Jakar's sword, north across the fingers and the waters of the bite. He led it briefly in Sisterton, where Lord Borel and Lord Sunderland did obeisance to him and pledged him the support of the three sisters. Then flew on to White Harbour, where Lord Desmond Manderley met with him in his merman's court. Here the prince faced a shrewder bargainer, White Harbour is not unsympathetic to your mother's plight, Manderley declared. My own forebears were despoiled of their birthright when our enemies drove us into exile on these cold northern shores. When the old king visited us long ago, 
He spoke of the wrong that had been done to us and promised to make redress. In pledge of that, his grace offered his hand of his daughter, Princess Vassera, to my great grandsire, that our two houses might be made as one, but the girl died and the promise was forgotten. Prince Jakarish knew what was being asked of him. Before he left White Harbour, a compact was drawn up and signed, by the terms of which Lord Mandalay's youngest daughter would be wed to the prince's brother Joffrey once the war was over. Finally, Vermax carried Jakarish Valera onto Winterfell to treat with its formidable young lord, Cregan Stark. In the fullness of time, Cregan Stark would become known as the Old Man of the North. But the Lord of Winterfell but was one in twenty when Prince Jakaris came to him in 129 AC. Cregan had come into his lordship at 13 upon the death of his father, Lord Rickon, in 121 AC. During his minority, his uncle Bernard had ruled the North as regent, but in 124 AC, Cregan turned 16, only to find his uncle slow to surrender his power. Relations between the two grew strained as the young lord chafed under the limits imposed upon him by his father's brother. Finally, in 126 AC, Cregan Stark rose up, imprisoned Bernard and his three sons and took the rule of the north into his own hands. Soon after, he wed Lady Ara Noray, a beloved companion since childhood, only to have her die in 128 AC whilst giving birth to a son and heir whom Cregan named Rickon after his father. Autumn was well advanced when the Prince of Dragonstone came to Winterfell. The snows lay deep upon the ground, a cold wind was howling from the north, and Lord Stark was in the midst of his preparations for the coming winter, yet he gave Jakaris a warm welcome. Snow and ice and cold made Vermax ill-tempered, it is said, so the Prince did not linger long amongst the Northmen. But many a curious tale came out of that short sojourn. Monken's true tellings says that Cregan and Jacaris took a liking to each other, for the boy prince reminded the Lord of Winterfell of his own younger brother, who had died ten years before. They drank together, hunted together, trained together, and swore an oath of brotherhood, sealed in blood. This seems more credible than Septon Eustace's version wherein the prince spends most of his visit attempting to persuade Lord Cregan to give up his false gods and accept the worship of the Seven. But we turn to Mushroom to find the tales of other chronicles omit, nor does he fail us now. His account introduces a young maiden, or wolf girl as he dubs her, with the name of Sarah Snow. So smitten was Prince Icarus with this creature, a bastard daughter of the late Lord Rickon Stark, that he lay with her of a night. On learning that his guest had claimed the maidenhead of his bastard sister, Lord Cregan became most wroth and only softened when Sarah Snow told him that the prince had taken her for his wife. They had spoken their vows in Winterfell's own godswood before a heart tree and only then had she given herself to him, wrapped in furs amidst the snows as the old gods looked on. This makes for a charming story, to be sure, but as with many of Mushroom's fables, it seems to partake more of a fool's favoured imagination than of historical truth. Jacaris Valeron had been betrothed to his cousin Bela since he was four and she was two, and from all we know of his character, it seems most unlikely he would break such a solemn agreement to protect the uncertain virtue of some half-wild, unwashed northern bastard. If indeed there ever lived a Sarah Snow, and if indeed the Prince of Dragonstone perchance to dally with her, that is no more than other princes have done in the past, and will do on the morrow, but the talk of marriage is preposterous. Mushroom also claims that Vermax left a clutch of dragon eggs at Winterfell, which is equally absurd. Whilst it is true that determining the sex of a living dragon is a nigh on impossible task, no other source mentions Vermax producing so much as a single egg, so it is must be assumed that he was male. Septon Barr's speculation that the dragons change sex as need, being immutable as flame, is too ludicrous to consider. Things we do know. Craig and Stark and Jacaris Valeron reached an accord and signed and sealed the agreement that Grandmaster Munken calls the Pact of Ice and Fire in his true telling. Like much such parts, it was to be sealed with the marriage. Lord Craig's son, Rickon, was a year old. Prince Jacaris 
was as yet unmarried and childless, but it was assumed that he would sire children of his own once his mother sat the Iron Throne. Under the terms of the pact, the prince's first-born daughter would be sent north at the age of seven to be fostered at Winterfell until such time as she was old enough to marry Lord Cregan's heir. When the Prince of Dragonstone took his dragon back into the cold autumn sky, he did so with the knowledge that he had won three powerful lords and all their bannermen for his mother. Though his 15 name day was still half a year away, Prince Jacaris had proved himself a man and a worthy heir to the Iron Throne. Had his brother's shorter, safer flight gone as well, much bloodshed and grief might well have been averted. The tragedy that befell Lucarus Valeron at Storm's End was never planned. On this, all our sources agree. The first battles in the Dance of Dragons were fought with quills and ravens, with threats and promises, decrees and blandishments. The murder of Lord Beesbury at the Green Council was not yet widely known. Most believed his lordship to be languishing in some dungeon. While sundry familiar faces were no longer seen about court, no heads had appeared above the castle gates, and many still hoped that the question of succession might be resolved peacefully. The stranger had other plans. For surely it was his dread hand behind the ill chance that brought the two princelings together at Storm's End, when the dragon Arax raced before a gathering storm to deliver the curious Valeron to the safety of the castle yard, only to find Aemon Targaryen there before him. Boris Baratheon was a man of much different character than his father. Lord Boromund was stone, hard and strong and unmoving, Septon Eustace tells us. Lord Boris was the wind that rages and howls and blows this way and that. Prince Aemon had been uncertain what sort of welcome he would receive when he set out, but Storm's End welcomed him with feasts and hunts and jousting. Lord Boris proved more than willing to entertain his suit. I have four daughters, he told the prince. Choose any one you like. Cass is oldest. She will be the first to flower. But Floris is prettier. And if it's a clever wife you want, there's Maris. Rianra had taken House Baratheon for granted for too long, his lordship told Damon. Aye, Princess Rhaenys is kin to me and mine. Some great aunt I never knew was married to her father. But the both of them are dead, and Rianra? She's not Rhaenys, is she? He had nothing against women, Lord Boris went on to say. He loved his girls. A daughter is a precious thing. But a son? Ah, should the gods ever grant him a son of his own blood, Storm's End would pass to him, not to his sisters. Why should the Iron Throne be any different? And with a royal marriage in the offing, Rhaenyra's cause was lost. She would see that when she learned that she had lost Storm's End, he would tell her so himself. Bow down to your brother. Aye, it's for the best. His girls would fight with each other sometimes, the way girls do. But he saw to it that they always made peace afterward. We have no record of which daughter Prince Aemon finally decided on, though Mushroom tells us that he kissed all four to taste the nectar of their lips. Save that it was not Maris. Munkin writes that the Prince and Lord Boris were haggling over dates and diaries on the morning Lucarus Valeron appeared. Vagar sensed his coming first. Guardsmen walking the battlements of the castle's mighty curtain walls clutched their spears in sudden terror when she woke with a roar that shook the very foundations of Durin's defiance. Even Arx quailed before that sound, we were told, and Luke plied his whip freely as he forced him down. Mushroom would have us believe that the lightning was flashing to the east and a heavy rain falling as Lucas slept off his dragon, his mother's message clutched in his hand. He must surely have known what Vagar's presence meant, so it would have come to no surprise when Aemon Targaryen confronted him in the round hall before the eyes of Lord Boris, his four daughters, Septim and Meister, and two score knights, guards and servants. Amongst those who witnessed this meeting were Sir Byron Swan, second son of the Lord of Stonehelm in the Dornish marches, who would have his own small part to play later in the dance. So here for once, we need not rely entirely on Grandmeister Munkin, Mushroom and Septon Eustace. None of them were present at Storm's End, but many others were. So we have no shortage of first-hand accounts. Look at that sad creature, my lord, Prince Eamon called out. Little Luke Strong, the bastard. To Luke he said, you are wet, bastard. 
Is it raining or did you piss yourself in fear? Lugaris Valeran addressed himself only to Lord Baratheon. Lord Boris, I have brought you a message from my mother, the Queen. The whore of Dragonstone, he means. Prince Aemon strode forward, a maid to snatch the letter from Lucas's hand. But Lord Boris roared a command, and his knights intervened, pulling the princelings apart. One brought Rhaenyra's letter to the dais, where the lordship sat upon the throne of the Storm Kings of old. No man can truly know what Boris Baratheon was feeling at that moment. The accounts of those who were there differ markedly from one to the other. Some say his lordship was red-faced and abashed, as a man might be if his lawful wife found him abed with another woman. Others declare that Boris appeared to be relishing the moment, for it pleased his vanity to have both king and queen seeking his support. Mushroom, who was not there, says he was drunk. Septim Eustace, who was not there, says he was fearful. Yet all the witnesses agree on what Lord Boris said and did. Never a man of letters, he handed the Queen's letter to his maester, who cracked the seal and whispered the message into the Lordship's ear. A frown stole across Lord Boris's face. He stroked his beard, scowled at Ligur's Valeron and said, And if you do as your mother bids, which one of my daughters will you marry, boy? He gestured at the four girls. Pick one. Prince Lucas could only blush. My lord, I am not free to marry, he replied. I am betrothed to my cousin Rihanna. I thought as much, Lord Boris said. Go home, pup, and tell the bitch your mother that the Lord of Storm's End is not a dog that she can whistle up and need to set against her foes. And Prince Lucas turned to take his leave of the round hall. But Prince Eamon drew his sword and said, Hold strong, first pay the debt you owe me. Then he tore off his eye patch and flung it to the floor to show the sapphire beneath. You have a knife, just as you did then. Put out your eye and I will let you leave. One will serve. I would not blind you. Prince Lucas recalled his promise to his mother. I will not fight you. I came here as an envoy, not a knight. You came here as a craven and a traitor, Prince Eamon answered. I will have your eye or your life, strong. At that, Lord Boris grew uneasy. Not here, he grumbled. He came as an envoy. I want no bloodshed beneath my roof. So his guards put themselves between the princelings and escorted Lucas Fleuron from the round hall, back to the castle yard where his dragon, Arax, was hunched down in the rain, awaiting his return. And there it might have ended, but for the girl Maris. The second-born daughter of Lord Boris, less comely than her sisters, she was angry with Eamon for preferring them to her. Was it one of your eyes he took, or one of your balls? Maris asked the prince, in tones sweet as honey. I am so glad you chose my sister. I want a husband with all his parts. Eamon Targaryen's mouth twisted in rage, and he turned once more to Lord Boris, asking for his leave. The Lord of Storm's End shrugged and answered, It is not for me to tell you what to do when you are not beneath my roof and his knights moved aside as Prince Eamon rushed to the doors. Outside, the storm was raging. Thunder rolled across the castle, the rain fell in blinding sheets, and from time to time, great bolts of blue-white lightning lit the world as bright as day. It was bad weather for flying, even for a dragon, and Arax was struggling to stay aloft when Prince Eamon mounted Vagar and went after him. Had the sky been calm, Prince Lucas might have been able to outfly his pursuer, for Arax was younger and swifter, but the day was as black as Prince Eamon's heart, says Mushroom, and so it came to pass that the dragons met above Shipbreaker Bay. Watchers on the castle walls saw distant blasts of flame and heard a shriek cut the thunder. Then the two beasts were locked together, lightning crackling around them. Vagar was five times the size of her foe, the hardened survivor of a hundred battles. If there was a fight, it could not have lasted long. Arax fell, broken, to be swallowed by the storm-lashed waters of the bay. His head and neck washed up beneath the cliffs below Storm's End three days later to make a feast for crabs and seagulls. Mushroom claims that Prince Lucas's corpse washed up as well and tells us that Prince Aemon cut out his eye and presented them to Lady Maris on a bed of seaweed. But this 
seems excessive. Some say Vagar snatched Lycoris off the dragon's back and swallowed him whole. It has even been claimed that the prince survived his fall, swam to safety, but lost all memory of who he was, spending the rest of his days as a simple-minded fisherman. The true telling gives all these tales the respect they deserve, which is to say, none. Lucas Valeron died with his dragon, Munkin insists. This is undoubtedly correct. The prince was 13 years of age. His body was never found. And with his death, the war of ravens and envoys and marriage packs came to an end. And the war of fire and blood began in earnest. Eamon Targaryen, who would henceforth be known as Eamon the Kinslayer to his foes, returned to King's Landing, having won the support of Storm's End for his brother Aegon and the undying enmity of Queen Rhaenyra. If he thought to receive a hero's welcome, he was disappointed. Queen Alicent went pale when she heard what he had done, crying, Mother have mercy on us all. Nor was Sir Otto pleased. You only lost one eye, he is reported to have said. How could you be so blind? The king himself did not share their concerns, however. Aegon II welcomed Prince Aemon home with a great feast, hailed him as the true blood of the dragon, and announced that he had made a good beginning. On Dragonstone, Queen Rhaenyra collapsed when told of Luke's death. Luke's young brother Joffrey, Jace was still away on his mission north, swore a terrible oath of vengeance against Prince Aemon and Lord Boris. Only the intervention of the Sea Snake and Princess Rhaenys kept the boy from mounting his own dragon at once. Mushroom would have us believe he played a part as well. As the Black Council sat to consider how to strike back, a raven arrived from Harrenhal. An eye for an eye, a son for a son, Prince Damon wrote. The Keras will be avenged. Let it not be forgotten, in his youth, Damon Targaryen had been the prince of a city. His face and laugh familiar to every cut purse, whore and gambler in Fleabottom. The prince still had friends in the low places of King's Landing and followers amongst the gold cloaks. Unbeknownst to King Aegon, the Hand or the Queen Dowager, he had allies at court as well, even on the Green Council. And one other go-between, a special friend he trusted utterly, who knew the wine sinks and the rat pits that festered in the shadow of the Red Keep as well as Damon himself once had and moved easily through the shadows of the city. To this pale stranger he reached out now, by secret ways to set a terrible vengeance into motion. Amidst the stews of Flea Bottom, Prince Damon's go-between found suitable instruments. One had been a sergeant in the city watch, big and brutal. He had lost his gold cloak for beating a horde of death whilst in a drunken rage. The other was a rat catcher in the Red Keep. Their true names are lost to history. They are remembered, with that they were not, as blood and cheese. Cheese knew the Red Keep better than the shape of his own cock, Mushroom tells us. The hidden doors and secret tunnels that Magor the Cruel had built were as familiar to the rat catcher as to the rats he hunted. Using a forgotten passage, Cheese led blood into the heart of the castle, unseen by any guard. Some say their quarry was with the king himself, but Aegon was accompanied by the king's guard wherever he went and even Cheese knew of no way in and out of Magor's Holdfast, save over the drawbridge that spanned the dry moat and its formidable iron spikes. The Tower of the Hand was less secure. The two men crept up through the walls, bypassing the spearmen posted at the tower doors. Sir Otto's rooms were of no interest to them. Instead, they slipped into his daughter's chambers, one floor below. Queen Alicent had taken up residence there after the death of King Viserys, where their son Aegon moved into Magor's Holdfast with his own queen. Once inside, Cheese bound and gagged the Darger Queen, whilst blood strangled her bedmaid. They settled down to wait, for they knew it was the custom of the Queen Helena to bring her children to see their grandmother every evening before bed. Blind to her danger, the Queen appeared as dusk was settling over the castle, accompanied by her three children, Jaharis, Jahera were six, Melor two. As they entered the apartments, Helena was holding his little hand and calling out her mother's name. Blood barred the door and slew the Queen's guardsmen, whilst Cheese appeared to snatch up Melor. Scream and you will die, Blood told her Grace. Queen Helena kept her clam, it is said. 
Who are you? She demanded of the two. Debt collectors, said Cheese. An eye for an eye. A son for a son. We only want one to square things. Won't hurt the rest of you fine folks. Not one little hair. Which one you want to lose, your grace? Once she realised what he meant, Queen Helena pleaded with the men to kill her instead. A wife's not a son, said Blood. It has to be a boy. Cheese warned the Queen to make a choice soon before Blood grew bored and raped her little girl. Pick, he said, or we will kill them all. On her knees, weeping, Helena named her youngest, Melor. Perhaps she thought the boy was too young to understand, or perhaps it was because the older boy, Jaharis, was King Aegon's firstborn son and heir, next in line to the Iron Throne. You hear that, little boy? Cheese whispered to Melor. Your mama wants you dead. Then he gave blood a grin, and the hulking swordsman slew Prince Jaharis, striking off the boy's head with a single blow. The queen began to scream. Strange to say, the rat catcher and the butcher were true to their word. They did no further harm to Queen Helena or her surviving children, but rather fled with the prince's head in hand. A hue and cry went up, but Cheese knew the secret passageways as the guards did not, and the killers made their escape. Two days later, blood was seized at the gate of the gods trying to leave King's Landing with the head of Prince Jaharis hidden in one of his saddle sacks. Under torture, he confessed that he had been taken at the Harren Hall to collect his reward from Prince Damon. He also gave up a description of the whore he claimed had hired them, an older woman, foreign by her talk, cloaked and hooded, very pale. The other harlots called her misery. After 13 days of torment, blood was at last allowed to die. Queen Alicent had commanded Lars Clubfoot to learn his true name so that he might bathe in the blood of his wife and children, but our sources do not say if this occurred. Sir Luther Largent and his gold cloaks searched the street of silk from top to bottom and turned out and stripped every harlot in King's Landing, but no trace of cheese or the white woman was ever found. In his grief and fury, King Aegon II commanded that all the city's rat catchers be taken out and hanged, and this was done. Sir Otto Hightower brought 100 cats into the Red Keep to take their place. Though blood and cheese had spared her life, Queen Helena cannot be said to have survived that fateful dusk. Afterward, she would not eat, nor bathe, nor leave her chambers, and she could no longer stand to look upon her son, Melor, knowing that she had named him to die. The king had no recourse but to take the boy from her and give him over to their mother, the Darger Queen, Alicent, to raise as if he were her own. Aegon and his wife slept separately thereafter, and Queen Helena sank deeper and deeper into madness, whilst the king raged and drank and raged. This dance of the dragons, or dying of dragons, is certainly starting to heat up, guys. Next week, join us for the next chapter, chapter 15, the dying of the dragons, the red dragon and the gold. Definitely starting to look forward to this House of the Dragon now. It's going to be epic as fuck. Like, share and subscribe. Check out Thursday's video. Join us on Sunday for the live stream. We watch us at 7pm GMT. And until next week, guys, for the watch.